something like live stream shopping just makes sense. You tune in, you love the personality, and you know it's it's the QVC effect times a thousand. Hey everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the Influence Factor by the Influencer Marketing Factory. Today with me, Dylan Arari, VP and Creator Partnership at Super Ordinary. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Fantastic. How how are things? Uh, uh, this the week started well. What's what's happening? What is exciting lately? You know, uh, when you're at a company uh, like what I'm at, we have a million things going on. Um, so it's it's always exciting, and it's it's that perfect blend of you know stress but exciting stress, not daunting stress. Okay, that's good. It's like the busy but busy good, right? So, exactly. Uh, yeah, that's that... a better way to put it. Love it, love it. And so for the people listening today, um, wh who are you? I, I know that you started like pretty young, I would say, and uh, you, you did a lot of projects and, you know, a, a lot of things, right? Uh, since uh, since you were like, uh, well, like a, a teenager, even maybe less than that. Yeah, uh, no, I'll, I, I'll give the full uh, story here, my, my full uh, Wikipedia, if I had one, if I could make the cut. So, um no, I mean, it's hilarious. So I'm, I'm 25 now and I'm for the first time in my career, I'm at a company where, I mean, for example, uh, my, uh, the people who oversee my work, I think are 23. So I'm, I'm facing for the first time in my life. I was so used to being, you know, the young kid. And, you know, now I'm at a stage where the inevitable happens where it's like, uh oh, you're not, you're now just normal guy. But um, yeah, I'll give the full story, the full everything. So um I started pretty young in, in almost the social media space. Um, tragically, I had a member of my immediate family who had, uh, you know, a, a type of cancer. Um, and I noticed this was like 2010, that there was no online community for families who had this kind of cancer, uh, especially on Facebook. You know, this is back 2010. This is Facebook's the coolest thing in the world, right? Um, there was, you know, fight against breast cancer, fight against uh, even colon cancer. But there was none for brain cancer, which was what the member of my uh, immediate family had. So I created a community there, uh, the fight against brain cancer. It, it quickly skyrocketed to 10,000 very active people who, you know, were impacted either directly or a family member was impacted, sharing their stories, cultivating a community. So that was a really amazing experience. Um, that I put a lot of attention to and I sort of retired, I'd say a few years ago when uh, about at 19, I started uh, working with brands and creators specifically on YouTube. So a lot of uh, e-commerce brands, D2C brands, uh, getting them activated through YouTubers. Uh, and that was an incredible experience. So, you know, working with a lot of YouTubers as, hey, you know, I'm, I'm by no means your manager. However, I have access to an array of different really amazing brands that are trying to find their footing in the uh, trying to find their footing in the uh, creator space, trying to get activated with creators uh, to brands. It was, hey, we have, you know, I have an array of different content creators who know how to sell a service that they're passionate about. So I did that for about three and a half years. Uh, then I moved over to Jelly Smack, which has obviously made some huge waves in this space, uh, managing some of the more Lighthouse clients such as PewDiePie, how ridiculous, uh, really helping scale their uh, distribution to many different platforms and, you know, best monetize there. Um, and from then I, I went on to Patreon where I was heading the, the mid-market uh, department. So that, that was creators who are in a mid-market sector. I don't know if I'm allowed to say the exact range that was in earning wise, but, you know, it spanned 3000 creators. So developing a, a you know, wide scale uh, strategy of how do we give coverage to these creators? How do I identify the creators who, man, with a bit more support, we could stimulate some really amazing growth. Um, so that was an absolute blast. You know, Patreon's an incredible company. And I've since moved on to Super Ordinary, where I'm overseeing creator partnerships. Um, Super Ordinary, I'll give the rundown. It's, it's the leading global growth partner and marketplace expert uh, connect brands, creators, uh, and consumers. There's, I, I think, north at this point, north of 300 brands uh, in the super ordinary mix. And 
you know, what Super Ordinary is really specialized in is, you know, all these brands wanted to make waves in China. I'm sure you've seen the numbers of, you know, live stream shopping in China, how massive it is. And really it quickly, Super Ordinary became the agency that, man, if you want to launch in China, or really Southeast Asia, I mean, if you want to launch, you go through Super Ordinary. They know how to optimize this. They know how to activate the best creators on all these different platforms in China. Um, they're really the best of the best. So quickly, all of these massive companies, um, and you can go to the website and see all of these. I can't name all, all 300 or so, but uh, really scaling there. So now we're doing that. In addition, Superordinary has acquired an amazing monetization platform called Fanfix. You can think about it as the Gen Z Patreon um, and creators are making significant money, some six figures monthly um, by creating and cultivating a community uh, through membership. There's paid messaging and tips. Um, and it's really incredible watching this become for so many Gen Z creators. Wow, this is my leading revenue stream. So that is the abridged version of my entire career. Uh, so let's end the podcast there. 10 minutes in, that's, that's everything. <laughs> no, thank you for sharing that. It's, it's, uh, it's really actually interesting to know that you, you know, been into Jalice Mac first and Pezzer and now Super Ordinary. So even before getting more into, you know, maybe Super Ordinary and also more asking you about the content creators and the creator economy. Um, and if you can share that, can you share like maybe one thing, like the most important thing that you learned at your time at Jalice Mac, the most important thing that you learned at Pezzer and now I know that you're still quite new to Super Ordinary, but if there is anything that you haven't learned maybe before that you're learning now, since it's also a different market, uh, right? A different demographics potentially. Totally. And I mean, what's I'll, I'll go almost in a reverse order there. What's amazing about Super Ordinary is, you know, I, I spent three and a half years in what you could call influencer marketing slash kind of blended talent management and influencer marketing a solution for both almost. And it's amazing. I think super ordinary that you take that and then you also take the membership end of things from something like Patreon. So it's really been incredible. We've been moving at breakneck speeds, even though I'm only three months in and it's pretty unbelievable the strides we've made. Um, but, you know, super ordinary I and mean, learning so much in terms of, hey, these are creators. What we have at super ordinary is really a creator wants to scale their business, whether that's, hey, I want to get on more platforms. Hey, I want more brand deals. Hey, I want a gated community. Hey, I want to think about building out a, a exclusive product line, merchandise. We really have the capabilities and we've already delivered on this for many creators. So, you know, it's really incredible because it's more we can have a conversation with a creator who is, you know, a superstar, an A plus creator that shows all markers of being incredibly unique in this you know, sometimes oversaturated space and say, hey, listen, we can help you scale. Let's have a conversation about what you're looking for. How do you see your business in five years? So that's been incredibly enlightening. Patreon, I mean, fascinating seeing, hey, listen, how do we create a cultivate a community through a membership platform? You know, that was that was a really amazing experience working with creators who you know, maybe they hadn't figured out their leading revenue stream where, you know, maybe merch was very sporadic in terms of sales. AdSense on YouTube was not reliable. And then, wow, it all made sense for them. Their community was perfectly tailor-made for a membership platform. And finding those creators, identifying them, helping them grow and scale was amazing. And then, you know, Jelly Smack, you have to give props times a thousand, where now it's the talk of the town is like, Listen, creators have very lucrative catalogs and, you know, they can be distributed across many platforms. Too many creators have all their eggs in one platform basket because AdSense is so significant. They're going, man, if I'm making six figures from YouTube, I don't really care about these other platforms and figuring out the right approach. But Jelly Smack were the early identifiers of, wow, you know, these creators are leaving a lot of money on the table. And, you know, seeing firsthand how some of these you could almost call them alternative platforms because everybody is going to say YouTube is really the primary place to be. That's, you know, that is a huge generalization, but for the sort of creators we're talking about here um, and seeing, wow, there are many different avenues across these different platforms uh, to monetize, make 
you know, ungodly sums through AdSense. So very enlightening. Those are the big three. And then I'm not going to go over everything else with influencer marketing and uh, the talent management side of things prior. But um, yeah, a lot of learnings along the way. Fantastic. So I'm pretty sure that you also have seen in the past, I would say, not even five years, just maybe three years that content creators change it a lot, right? Yeah. But being from like being merely people that were even creating content or just promoting third party products to being, you know, savvier people. Some of them are becoming solopreneurs. Some others actually entrepreneurs with a, a small, medium or bigger, I don't say like a you know, big team, you know, because some of them maybe are like maybe five people out and 10 of them, you know, uh, and then, uh, so we're, they're going into, they're really shifting, right? Their priorities. And some of them also, they are thinking about longevity, how they can go on the long term. Uh, also because you want to, uh, as we said before, diversify your uh, revenue stream. You don't want to put all the eggs in one basket. So, uh, can you say a, a bit more uh, about that? I know that you already mentioned that, but is there anything specific that you are noticing in the content creators, uh, you know, industry or in the creator economy? Um, what is, in your opinion, the biggest shift? Are you seeing that in physical products? Are you seeing that in digital items? Uh, is it a combination? Uh, do you see it only for big influencers, mid tiers, uh, smaller ones? Uh, what, what's happening now? Totally. I mean, I think the big shift in one area a lot of people are talking about is, you know, there, there was a podcast I'm blanking on, but it got shared and distributed all across LinkedIn. Um, and it was a really good point that, you know, what say Mr. Beast is doing or say Kim Kardashian is doing, it's, it's, hey, you know, the end game is to build your own brand that then lives on and has a life of its own. I think Logan Paul is a great example. You know, for the macro of macro creators, I'll start there and then I'll go down. But for the macro of macro creators, Logan Paul is a great example is imagine if Prime, his you know Gatorade competitor, ends up getting sold for like a billion dollars. It builds on a life of its own, a brand identity of its own. He can almost look back at his career and go, man, I spent, you know, call it 10 years in content creation. Granted, it was 10 very lucrative years. He's doing incredibly well for himself, but it was all building up to the culmination of now I can push all of this influence all of the attention I've garnered, all of the respect I've deserved from this community into a brand and into a product that can outlive Logan Paul. You know, I think about like, uh, I know a lot of celebrities have had theirs. I'm going to blank on the names, but like, you know, Jessica, so-and-so, and, you know, many creators have done this successfully. They created their own brand. So I think for the macro of macro, that's what you're going to start to see because you know, imagine how hard it is to start from nothing and build your own brand. It's almost impossible. And I'm, I'm going to continue on this rant now because now I'm passionate about it. But, you know, I'd be even seeing this on TikTok where there are some creators have 100,000 followers. They create a whole brand identity, a whole everything. And it's all in the long game because they made their own clothing line or something like that. And then, bam, these clothing lines are selling out. Now, if this clothing line started from, hey, I'm going to go run some Instagram ads and that's it. I don't think anything would have happened there. But it was like a year of this guy building it. There's one guy in particular I've seen because I've studied it. But like he created a presence for himself, a level of respect. He showed his journey to the product. And now it's, oh, my God, that's amazing. And keep in mind that customer acquisition cost so low. All he had to do was create TikToks consistently. So I think you're going to see that a huge push there. And then say for more mid-market S creators, which that's such a subjective term, uh, I think a Jelly Smack-esque model, whether they outsource that to a company like Jelly Smack or they do that for themselves, where they are distributing their content to other platforms and they're diversifying their revenue streams. I think that's going to be one of the big areas. And you know, it's really shown to be over the past year. The amount of creators, I know creators who do say prank as content and they go, wow, my life changed the second I realized I can clip up these videos, put some of them on Instagram reels, some of them on Facebook video and bam, that changed everything. I went from making $90,000, uh, you know, a year to I am now nearing a million dollars thanks to optimizing for these other platforms. So for the more mid-market side, I think it's going to be that. And then for the smaller creators, very similar to what we talked about with that TikTok end of things. You know, 
I think it's it's the big wave now is, you know, like you would never make a podcast. I, this is my opinion. I don't think a podcast now, it's almost impossible for you to just start a podcast and go, all right, it's going to gain momentum. I'm going to wait. You know, it's people are going to start funneling into this. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, more it's you start with a discoverability platform. You could call it Instagram Reels, which I think does not get the respect it deserves because Instagram is still a massive 500 billion users. I mean, that's what did I say there? That's not true. 500 million, <laughs> you know, users. But um, yeah, that and then TikTok. And then bam, you can funnel this into something more lucrative like a podcast. Absolutely. No, I do agree that it's, uh, if you think about it, even just like a way older way to think in, in the content marketing, right? You do something and then you use the same for different formats. So back in the days it was, uh, okay, you do the blog post. From the blog post, you can create an infographic. From the infographic, a little video. Now it's even easier to make content because you really have a plethora of different tools that have a lot of integrations at, with one click. Even nowadays, I'm, I'm studying what is happening with Meta that uh, instead of just uh, uh, you know text to photo, you have text to video. I don't know if you saw that project, it's pretty new. So uh, just to say, content creators really have uh, an easier time, I would say, right? But I also do agree that you cannot just post something outside and be like, okay, let's wait. No, you have, you have to do more, absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, we mostly uh, mentioned before, uh, you know, and you also mentioned US influencers, but since now you're working in Super Ordinary, you're also, of course, right, uh, looking at what is happening in China. We all know that... Uh, U.S. influencers versus the Chinese um, Q opinion leaders, and nowadays also Q opinion consumer are really different, right? Uh, between approach to uh, work, uh, different market, uh, cultural differences. Uh, what else do you think that makes a huge difference between uh, um, the U.S. and China, especially when it comes to, for example, things like live stream shopping, uh, social commerce, uh, and overall just approach to creating content and selling online? Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of cultural elements that go into there. And as as the funny context, uh, my girlfriend, love of my life, uh, spent the first 22 years uh, in China. So, you know, I have somebody who I have, a, I have a focus group with me almost every single day. You know what I mean? So I really get to see what are the platforms, what's happening. I mean, she's hyper tapped in and has worked in the industry. So. I'm going to give some credit. A lot of it is, you know, based off the insights of her and her friends. And, you know, you could say almost throw informal little focus groups whenever I get the chance to have these conversations. But, you know, there's a lot that goes into there. I, I think one of the key elements is, you know, there's a rapidly growing middle class in China where what you have to realize is, you know, uh, for example, it's uh, the the you know, whether it's communism, capitalism, it's China has, has kind of blended this interesting uh, hybrid of the two over the past 20 years, because they realized, man, in order to compete, you know, we need these incentive structures. And bam, suddenly, I mean, they are just going at hyperdrive. And as we can all see, they're, they're expanding rapidly. Where that's important for this conversation is, you know, the middle class is just growing like exponentially. And there's always been in China, I think China is set to be the largest luxury market in a few years, where the idea of luxury and luxury goods is, is coveted uh, a lot more than it is here in the US. I'd say for, you know, average middle class citizen. And a part of that as well lends into a, a greater desire to experiment with products. That is massive in China, where people really want to see, okay, oh, I want to try this, I want to buy this, where I don't think that, you know, burning desire to experiment with products exists in the U.S. Where that matters for creators is something like live stream shopping just makes sense. You tune in, you love the personality, and, you know, it's, it's the QVC effect times a thousand in China where, oh, my God, I get to see what they do. And it's a part of being in that community is, oh, my God, I want to I buy this product. I want to get that. I want to, you know, so on and so forth. So, you know, there's a, there's an interesting element there where I think there's a burning desire to experiment with these products and that works really well with these live stream shopping. Um, you know, and then this is another observation. I'm, I'm parroting my, my girlfriend here where how she says it is, you know, there's a, this burning desire for luxury goods, but also there's a cultural element of like going to the shopping mall to a, 
Louis Vuitton store or whatever, if you're not the top of the top class, it doesn't feel as comfortable and natural. So, you know, that being channeled through one of these creators in e-commerce and, you know, usually fast shipping, even though right now there's been, you know, if you follow the news, there's been some insane supply chain issues as of recent. But like, um, you know, I, I think that's another huge end of it as well. Um, also, you know, the other areas to really focus on is like, I think people live stream shopping, I, I'm, I'm a huge skeptic in it becoming anywhere near as popular uh, in the US uh, or just, you know, North America broadly as it is in Southeast Asia. I, I just, I, I can't really see that happening. Um, you know, even like you compare it to some, I don't know, maybe like Vietnam and other countries, like it, it is working, uh, I'd say across Asia, but I don't see it happening for a lot of these cultural reasons. However, there's other elements like, man, when I look at uh, Instagram, Instagram is quickly becoming WeChat, which is so fascinating to see where WeChat is, this is how I communicate, this is texting, but it's also a bit of a social media. I post my WeChat moments and I see, you know, what, uh, you know, the response I get, the likes I get, you know, there's a culture around posting and tailoring your posts, but this is also the platform I use to text my mom and grandma. So I'm seeing Instagram become very similar where people are sharing photos, sharing stories, but the DM feature is quickly becoming like, you know, the new contact book. It's like, Hey, I want to connect with you. I want to stay in your life. Instead of a number, let, let me get you on, on Instagram. I'll see little moments of your life now and then. We can respond to each other's stories. So it's been fascinating to see, and in a very similar vein, Little Red Book, huge, massive 200 million users app in China. It is the cool Gen Z app where, and I know I'm ranting to no end here, Alessandro. I'm going to try to finish. But, you know, this is the funny thing is like, I cringe every time I see on LinkedIn someone write, Oh, you know, Doyen, I, which I must be mispronouncing because I'm an idiot. But, you know, oh, it's so big in, in China and like you have to focus on where it is. What people really don't understand is that app in China, TikToks uh, in China is nowhere near as cool as it is TikTok in America. TikTok in America is cool. It's like, oh, my God, TikTok, ha, ha, ha. Whereas in China, it's a little bit less cool of, a, of an app. Like, it's kind of this cringy, like, oh my God, it's so, it's for little kids. It's for like, what are you doing? Like, whereas Little Red Book, oh my God, that is the cool, sexy app. That is, oh my God, I'm posting on Red or there's influencers on Red. I mean, some of the biggest uh, creators coming out of China right now are based out of Red. And it's all around peer recommendation. So it's fascinating to see. And that's the end of my China rant. Uh, no, so but- pass my but Actually, thank you for sharing that. And, and I, I absolutely know what you mean. Um, you, again, you have the, you're lucky enough, right, to have, uh, uh, people that are from China and can, uh, destroy in a way like that barrier that is even just the language barrier that is really difficult. One day I, uh, I downloaded the same day, I think 15 Chinese apps, mostly about video. When I open them, since I don't know Chinese, I'm, I'm willing now to actually soon to start, uh, you know, learning, uh, uh, Mandarin actually, because I, I know you, how, you and me both. you know, how important it is. Right. So it's, it's in my <laughs> plan, future, future plan, actually, because you know what, when I open these apps, the layout is pretty the same. Uh, the recommendation is quite similar. They're browsing it. So, uh, when I talked with someone that, uh, is not from China, but lived in China for 20 years, uh, this person told me like these, uh, conglomerate uh, every year, they maybe build hundred apps. They do spray and pray type of approach, right? And because of the huge market, I mean, like China, what is it? One billion and 300 million of people, right? Something like yeah. that, I think, right? Having like 300 million of users on an app, it's normal. It's actually, it's not that, that much, right? So I, I totally understand when you say that uh, people that do not really know about China, they listen about it, they hear things, right? And they got lost in translation between Chinese media that can, you know, maybe they uh, got an article in the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg and so on, but they are filtered in a way, right? With different cultures. And therefore, unless you don't really have someone that can show it to you and translate it for you. Uh, and, and for Red, I also see that I was reading something about the peer to peer connection with some, some sort of like Pinterest based yeah. video, like, right. It's all, it's all together. Right. Uh, and it's, it's fascinating. So, uh, so, so you said that you're playing with that, but uh, let me ask you just quick 
uh, this quickly before we go to the next question. But uh, so you said that you don't see the live streaming as it is in China or in Asia, in, in, you know, more generally speaking, coming to the US. But what about super apps? Because b before you mentioned WeChat, do you think that we potentially can go to a model where we're going to have really one place for payments, peer-to-peer uh, -peer connections, recommendations, and so on? Or do you think the US is still a bit individualistic in a, in a sense of uh, capitalism where you prefer to no, do not collaborate and having actually one place for each different action? So this, I mean, this is what I've been thinking about, Alessandro, endlessly. And this is where I'm so curious to see what happens. I am very skeptical of live stream shopping being a mere fraction as successful in America as it is in China. Whereas super apps, that's where I'm very bullish, you know. But listen, I'm going to start with the counter arguments. Snapchat. Very recently, as they shuttered uh, their hardware division, their gaming division, they shuttered their minis division. That was, hey, there's a mental health app. There's all of this. Keep in mind, uh, Snapchat uh, is majorly backed by Tencent. I'm, I'm almost positive on this, but you can Google and fact check if that's wrong. But, um, you know, Tencent, one of the biggest, if not the biggest tech giant in China, um, who is behind, um, is it WeChat or Ali? No, it must be WeChat. Um, and check me on this because there might be somebody cringing at what I'm saying. But um, regardless, listener, um, no. So, you know, that was very shocking that clearly that was not successful. Whereas I, I have to believe that super apps are going to be huge in super apps for a listener for greater context, like China Alipay, which is how you pay, think about it maybe as like a Venmo. But guess what? On Alipay, there's also a, uh, a Farmville-esque game. You know, and it's like you do things within the app on WeChat. Yeah, it's communication, but you can also order your uh, Uber or, you know, it's not called Uber, obviously, but same service. Uh, you can get your groceries, whatever it may be. So it's multiple things with ha happening within the app. And, you know, I think increasingly what we're starting to see here in America is like people want to be on specific platforms. They don't want to jump to 40 different websites that are tailored to everything. I'll use an interesting example, Reddit. Reddit was it so huge because, hey, instead of I have a discussion board for this interest and I go to this URL and then I have a totally separate interest, I love Survivor, the TV show, and I love uh, barbecuing. I have to go to two separate websites to indulge in the message threads for these two interests I have. Where Reddit goes, how about you have it all you know, aggregated into one platform? So that is kind of a super app ethos. So we've seen it work here. And, you know, I'm really bullish on the idea. And I think some players like Koji are really leaning into this. I think it's it's really smart where, hey, a link in bio, but guess what? It, it can do anything you want it to be. This can be, you know, a super app. So super apps are an area I'm very bullish on for the US. And But the counter argument is I don't know if anybody's really cracked it to a way where it, it mimics the success that it has in China. Yeah, I do agree. I think it's missing many, many factors, but uh, two of the biggest, in my opinion, are gamification and incentives. Up until yeah. you don't have that, uh, there is no reason, right, to, to be there. Um, but uh, jumping on, on something totally different uh, to start wrapping up on, on our, you know, uh, conversation together, because I also know that you are really uh active on linkedin and so and on your profile i check a couple of things that you you know uh wrote there and i know that you have a lot of engaging people that are even like you know liking sharing your posts and commenting so i wanted to maybe i i took some down i i'm gonna just ask you about a couple of them and then if i if there's any others like that maybe you shared lately please let me know uh but uh, a couple that i took down is one it's actually pretty inter interesting and um I think also I saw something about this topic on maybe a Colin and Samir show. They were talking about this also. And uh, it's about the top 10 most viewed YouTube channels are yeah. kids content, right? And they were saying that the YouTube kids, it's way different than, you know, you cannot comment. It, it, it's, it's, it's a sort of box, right? But uh, you as a kid that you can watch the same video 20 times in a day, and poor parents that they have to this right to the, yeah. to the same video over and over, but it's a lot of opportunities there. So, what do you think could happen in the next future? Like, it's gonna be like the same also for the I don't know, like next ten years. Do you still see kids' content as a big opportunity, not just for content creators but also for just the media 
as something to tap in more? Do you see it uh, too competitive nowadays? Uh, and especially, can we do something in the, with the YouTube shorts potentially? I don't know if they have it in, in uh, YouTube Kids, maybe no, but uh, do you think that we can go also there with a the vertical content for, for, for kids? Yeah, no, totally. So I'll speak on that. I mean, for one thing, you got, how about this? You went uh, 2019, you go to the top 10 most viewed YouTube pages of a week. It is all kids content, all kids content. It is Kids Diana show, Vlad and Nikki. It is Moonbug, which, you know, owns Coco Melon. Um, it is Ryan's Toy Reviews, Ryan's World. Uh, it goes on and on. That it is unbelievable, the viewership. And what's so significant there is, you know, speak to a more macro trend. It's like, you know, for example, there's uh, SNL, which they get like a million views. Saturday Night Live gets a million views when they repost a sketch and they put it on YouTube. But guess what? A million views can also be garnered by a guy who makes a sketch with his iPhone and nothing more for, you know, a, a mere small percentage of the budget, if even. Right. So what we're seeing is there's no longer this correlation between budget and viewership. So uh, we had a quick technical difficulty there, but but we're, we're right back to it. So, you know, you look to some of these other uh, channels like Vlad and Nikki, Blippi or Kids Diana show where the budget, I mean, geez, it, it must be nothing more than, you know, a Canon DSLR, a good microphone. Uh, you know, it must I mean, each video I cannot imagine surpasses. For some of them, like, I mean, God, $5,000, really. I mean, for each of these videos that garner sometimes hundreds of millions of views. So, you know, it's amazing to see that in a very similar vein. Now you look at the top most viewed YouTube channels and it's either kids content or YouTube shorts content. That's very easily consumable. So, you know, it is very interesting and the market is huge. What's going to be fascinating is YouTube is now going to start doing a I believe it's 4555 split for the YouTube shorts. So here, one, that's incredible. There are going to be so many creators who are good at making viral content and they're going to make a full-time living out of it. Where it's a little bit concerning is, you know, you're going to see so many creators who are creating only the most clickbaity of content ever to get views and get as much ad sense as possible. So we'll see how that pans out. But you know, the, the important element there is kids are the ones that are watching YouTube shorts, consuming it endlessly, and also watching these YouTube kids creators, right? These creators who are, you know, uh, making these unbelievably high viewed videos for a very cheap budget. And what that speaks to me is, God, Gen Alpha might love YouTube even more than Gen Z does, which Gen Z loves YouTube. So it, it's fascinating to see, and it... it to me says, wow, this next generation, YouTube is only going to proliferate. Their, you know, their market share, their uh, you know, attention, their respect, their credibility uh, in both the creator world and say just the viewership end of things as well. So it, it has me incredibly bullish on YouTube. Fantastic. And um, yeah, I mean, like, again, everyone is still looking at Gen Z, but uh, yeah, the, the Gen Alpha also, like, it's it's another another world. And we, we, unfortunately, we don't have the time to talk all about also all the metaverse, all the new type of content, all the integration, and the really kids making a lot of money, you know, out of Roblox. Uh, that, that is also something else, you know, that we might have for another discussion. But uh, um, anything else that you would like to share could be even uh, like apps that you are looking at that maybe no one know about or any new trends, something raising that you think that uh, uh, other marketers should uh, should look at? Yeah, well, I don't know about marketers, but if we're talking generally about the industry, one end of things I'm very bullish on is the catalog licensing model. So now we have Spotter. I, I want to say they did this first at scale, then Jelly Smack. You know, they could naturally take what they were doing on the content distribution and then, you know, add in an element of, hey, we'll, we'll purchase your entire catalog. And now Creative Juice, um, really incredible forward-thinking startup um, with an unbelievably smart team. Um, they uh, are now building out their own sort of unique approach to catalog advances. So that's an end of things I think is, is super fascinating where, you know, there are so many creators. I'll give an example. It's like Philip DeFranco is a news channel. 
there are not a lot of videos of his from three months ago that bam are getting today massive views. You know what I mean? But there are other video, there are other creators who make content that is quite simply evergreen. It is going to stay around. There is, you know, obviously the first day always brings in or first week a very significant pop, but like, you know, it doesn't precipitously fall like it would a more topical video. So suddenly of all these creators who have catalogs that are just endless money-making machines for years on end, one video can just be endlessly milked. You know, you can wring that towel forever. Um, so that idea, and then also we talk about the distribution model where you can syndicate to Snapchat. You can take your content and repurpose it for Facebook video and make significant money. So, you know, a lot of creators are sitting on gold mines thanks to the fact that they have these amazing catalogs that don't expire. So any of the creator startups that are really focusing in on those and, you know, helping partner with creators to really maximize revenue potential, uh, I think that is a, a hugely smart move. Absolutely. Interesting. Yeah, I'm also curious to see. And uh, uh, good to hear also that you mentioned about Creative Juice. It's uh, one of the episodes that actually that we recorded together um, oh, wow. a few weeks ago. So if anyone that is also interested in knowing more about uh, what uh, Dylan just, uh, just shared about, you know, some of the new tools, right, and platforms, uh, uh, we have some episodes just about really how platforms are helping out uh, um, content creators nowadays. Um, before we go, how can people connect with you? Uh, I said before that you're pretty active on LinkedIn. Is there any other social media where you usually connect with people? Um, you know, again, Instagram is WeChat. Uh, it's a great contact book. Feel free to send me a request there if, if you work in the industry and that's a great way to keep in touch. Outside of that, I mean, you know, LinkedIn is, is my home. Um, that is the platform that I'm, and by the way, talk about another platform I'm really bullish on. Ezra Cooperstein, not too long ago. Uh, made a post that I really resonated with where, you know, LinkedIn acts as this perfect blend of Twitter meets uh, a medium, you know, medium posts, like sort of blogs. So um, I totally agree. I think LinkedIn, a lot of people are going to be utilizing it. It's a really great tool. So uh, LinkedIn is definitely uh, another area to connect with me on. Amazing. I, I can see from your passion and your knowledge that this podcast episode could have been three hours and I wouldn't <laughs> mind. I just mind for the people Let's listening, do it. you know, but maybe we can do, we can do another, another session where we add, because I can clearly see that we left out a lot and you have re uh, not just like knowledge about that, but a passion. I can, I can definitely see that. So thank you so much for sharing this information. Uh, this was a really great conversation with a lot of, uh, you know, narrowed, you know, uh, insightful, Things that, you know, again, I think that uh, people should know about. Uh, too many people read about things without really knowing what is happening, right? So yeah. uh, I think that it was it was much needed. So thank you so much again for joining me today. This was another episode of The Influence Factor by The Influencer Marketing Factory, and I'll see you in the next episode.